Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I'm sorry I missed yesterday's talks. I, I'm really glad that there's so much uh, interest in bridging the gap between zoo and research uh, and research facilities. I'm just going to comment a little bit more about my background because it's really important to why I'm here and what I'm going to talk about, what I talk about. Uh, so I started as a lab animal veterinarian uh, and I was very lucky in Rochester that the program there was jointly run between the, the university and the zoo and so I spent uh, one to two days a week at the zoo and then did, did the laboratory animal residency at the same time and one of the challenges that we faced at the university for sure this was 2010 so um, the age of enforcement was was the, the where we were then uh, and so one of the challenges that we faced was social housing our, our rhesus macaques and, and struggling with that and what we really relied on a lot was what we were experiencing at the zoo with some of our very socially housed primates especially but other animals too who were enjoying a social experience that was vastly different from the animals that we uh, worked with at the at at the university, and so sort of that contrasting experience was really important to me as I developed as a veterinarian uh, and certainly became more interested in animal welfare and, and socializing animals with that contrast. So it's mid-morning, so I'll try to make this a little bit interactive. Uh, uh, so if we talk about social housing in research facilities, what are some reasons that we do that? Um, so we're, talk we're all here talking about social housing, so what, why do we do why is it important? Why are we doing it? Feel free to yell out. Yeah, so we want better research models, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, improve well being, absolutely. So I, I think it's really interesting, and it says a lot about what, about the group of people that's here today, uh, that, uh, that a regulatory requirement is not what anyone said. And for sure, that was when I was doing this at, at the university in 2010, that was our sort of our hammer, right? And that we, that we need it sometimes. Uh, and so, so we do it because it's a regulatory requirement. We want better research subjects. Uh, we want to improve animal well-being. And really, it's the right thing to do for social species. And so uh, the animals that are in our care, uh, I believe we have a moral obligation to provide them with the best lives that we can, considering what they're giving back to us. So we know all of this. So if some of you are from zoos, some of you may not be, um, but if you can think of uh, why do we socially house animals in zoos? Any ideas? Yeah, so a lot of the same reasons, right? Uh, and so, so it's a regulatory requirement for us, just like for, just like for research facilities. Uh, we do have a couple of differences within zoos. One of our major goals is conservation of species. So uh, for most animals, at least, uh, they have to be social to breed, to, to conserve themselves. Uh, we also want to exhibit species typical behaviors to our guests, so another major part of our mission is education and connecting people to, to wildlife and wild places. And so being able to show them what a normal animal looks like is really important to us. And so it, as we've uh, evolved in zoos, we've moved away from those menagerie style cages uh, where it was concrete blocks, animal after animal, uh, and we are moving towards these more naturalistic exhibits or habitats uh, where the animals have the opportunity to engage in more species typical behaviors, and we're trying to show our guests what that looks like. And that gives us the opportunity also to, uh, to do these interspecies exhibit or these mixed species exhibits uh, that are becoming more and more popular and more and more prevalent. And again, as a way to increase uh, the demonstration of species typical behaviors. And so these animals, uh, giraffe and zebra, would share the same habitat in the wild. And so we can give them that uh, recreation of that in a zoo uh, and hopefully stimulate some of those natural behaviors that we might see in the wild. And we can do that in research facilities too, and I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. And then again, it's the right thing to do for our social species. So talking about challenges to social housing uh, in research facilities, so what are some of the challenges that we, that we face when we do this? Space, yeah, so space is a big, is a big problem for us. Cost. Cost. Study yeah, study limitations, so research participation. 
Then just in terms of, in terms of knowledge of, of the species that we're, do, that we're dealing with, so there's a variety of, a wide variety of species, increasing numbers of species that are being used for research uh, with a variety of different social structures. And so actually having uh, people in our facilities or even resources outside of our facilities that we can go to that know about what a normal social structure in X animal is or in X species is uh, can be a challenge sometimes. Then there's a variety of individuals that we, that we work with in research facilities, and those have a variety of different social histories themselves. And we know uh, in lots of different species, monkeys and rabbits uh, being big ones, that their social experience has a, has a huge impact on their ability to be socially housed going forward. And, and often times when we're, when we're on the receiving end of these animals, we don't know much about what happened to them before they came to our facility. And that was something that I struggled with often when I was uh, selecting monkeys for, for researchers at the university, and all I'm looking at is maybe two or three pages of medical records, uh, and these animals at, at, at the University of Rochester, at least, were participating in these uh, long-term cognitive uh, neurobehavioral studies, so they were there 10 or 15 years uh, with the, the, the idea that we were going to socially house them, that they were going to participate in these research studies, and uh, one of the, the real challenges was uh, picking these, these animals, well, this, these look healthy, uh, and we'll hope it works out for the next 15 years. Uh, and so some of, the, some of the other things that I'll talk about are maybe if we can figure out more about that part of it include, and include that in our parameters of what we're looking at. And then we said small cages and enclosures. Uh, the need for unnatural social groups is a major challenge for us. So uh, for us, we didn't want our rhesus macaques to breed, so that meant all male groups or, or pairs or all female pairs, and that's a, a very unnatural way of living, right? Uh, same thing for rabbits. So uh, we all know how rabbits breed, right? Uh, so single sex groups, and that's a very unnatural uh, group, social grouping. Uh, and then we said research participation. So what about social housing in zoos? What are the challenges we might face there? Small numbers, right, exactly. So unnatural social group sizes, right? Um, so, so a very similar thing. So you saw our two giraffe and two zebra. That's, a, that's our social herd. Um, we, have, we have one of, uh, one of both species, too, but they, you know, it's hard to get them all in, in a family shot. Yeah, exactly. Small spaces. I'm glad you said that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, any, what else? Yeah, yeah, so, so having the opportunity for people to be able to see them. Um, yeah, and, and one of the things that, that, that is a real uh, driver for me is the similar, similarities, and um, something that I always used to say and, uh, is that every animal has a job to do, right? Uh, and so the research animals have jobs that they need to do, and, and our, our zoo animals have jobs that they need to do too, so they need to be out there and visible. Yeah. So really, very similar challenges in zoos than in, uh, and in research facilities that we're talking about. So a wide variety of species uh, and social structures. And so, so this is Katya, she's our Amor tiger. Uh, she lives alone, and so how many times a day do I, when I'm walking by, am I asked, um, you're, or am I told that our tiger is lonely? Uh, at least once every day. Uh, and so this, this is a very natural social structure for her to live in by herself. And it's difficult to see, but she's a very happy tiger in that picture. She just got a deer carcass. Um, so she's eating a deer. Uh, and, and we were just talking about risk uh, with, with feeding wild prey. And uh, Kathleen was talking about wild feeding, feeding different foods. Uh, and for sure, this is a, an opportunity that we have in zoos that is probably somewhat limited in research facilities. So, so addressing the social needs of that animal, of that species, versus the social needs of some of the other species that are much more social uh, is part of the challenges we face. Again, a variety of individuals with different social histories. So we have animals that may have been hand-reared, especially, especially a challenge uh, for primates like orangutans. Uh, when they're, when they're hand-reared, they become, they're often not good mothers themselves. So it's sort of a perpetuating cycle that we have to deal with. Uh, and, and especially in some of our other primates uh, and cats, these animals don't necessarily know how to be an orangutan or a gorilla uh, or a leopard. And so uh, if they don't have that maternal experience, Experience. So trying to deal with those issues uh, for, and give them the social skills that they may not have, that they may have missed out on in the, in the beginning of their lives is, is a problem. 
Uh, and I, I put small cages and closures on this list too, and I put it in, in um, quotes because uh, you might look at our uh, elephant exhibit or habitat, as we say, uh, that's a little less than a quarter of an acre and say, come on, Lewis, what are you talking about? Small spaces, what, what's your problem, right? Um, but when you're dealing with an animal that lives here, uh, that's, the, our quarter of, our acre, of an acre is very small, uh, and, and we know for sure that exhibit size is, is a significant uh, issue for, for, at least for our visitors, when they look at an exhibit uh, and, and question what we're doing and how we're housing animals. And the same thing that could be said of research facilities when we see uh, macaques in stainless steel cages, where, where size of the enclosure is, is a significant problem, considering where they live. And then I added, um, I, I said public scrutiny is maybe one difference that we have between zoos and research facilities. Um, for sure, we are, we're admissions driven, right? So we want to get people in the door, and so there's nothing that does that better than, well, uh, a baby animal does that the best, and then the second best is, uh, is a new animal. Uh, so we heavily promote when we get a new animal, uh, and when, when that doesn't go the way we're anticipating that it will, it leads to, to these sort of headlines where uh, we promoted, we're getting this new wild dog, it's gonna be great, we're gonna have babies, it's gonna be awesome, come to the zoo, come see it, uh, and then we put them together, and then the male kills the female, or in the case of tigers, the female kills the male, uh, and it's really sad. Uh, and then we have to go and defend why we did what we did and why we thought it was okay in our process uh, uh, for, for going through that in a really public way. And we also have uh, an increasingly skeptical public of what we're doing in zoos as well. Uh, and you know, for sure, research facilities have had this for a long time, and, and zoos have too. But more and more people question the, the way we house animals uh, in zoos, and, and, and so our zoo just uh, got on this list this past year for the first time um, among the worst use for elephants in the United States. And, uh, and so for sure, the way we house animals, their social structures, uh, considering the challenges to, to providing a normal social structure uh, for these different species is, is, uh, is important. But when I was putting this together, I was thinking, you know, I certainly encountered challenges, uh, media challenges, when I was working more at the university. Uh, and so uh, in research facilities, we have this same problem with, with animal extremists and, um, and this idea that what we're doing is inherently wrong with, with, with our man management of our research facilities. And so when we're talking about social housing and defending uh, what we're doing, this is a real opportunity for us to show how, what, how we care uh, and that we're really promoting giving these animals the best experience that we can. And so, um, so again, even though there's, there's gonna be skeptics, there's gonna be negatives, negative outcomes as part of what we're doing when we're socially housing, um, that we're trying, I think, is the bigger key that we have to make sure that we're sharing that message. So again, I um, think trying to think of so, trying to come up with something that's different, uh, and so uh, commitment to a lifetime of care. Uh, and so this is Lucy. She's our 42-year-old spider monkey that we uh, just just recently uh, came and went to California. Lucy was brought to Seneca Park Zoo about 10 years ago to join another very geriatric spider monkey named aptly named Spider Man. Uh, <laughs> Who, who? So they were supposed to live out their golden years together, uh, and uh, and so Spider Man died about a year ago, and so so we were left with Lucy, uh, and these are very social animals, uh, of course. And so, so we're, our zoo is phasing out spider monkeys, and it turns out a lot of zoos are phasing out spider monkeys for lots of different reasons. So it was a challenge for us to find a, a social group for Lucy to join, recognizing that she's 42 years old, even though she has no health problems that we can tell, um, she, except a little bit of arthritis. Uh, still, we have to provide for her, her social um, life going forward. Uh, but still, that's not really a difference because this is here for, for research facilities too, um, this, com this idea of a commitment to lifetime of care, for sure for animals like chimpanzees and really spreading and, and, and our, our counterparts in India have been doing this for a long time with retirement of research dogs uh, and, and other species that they use and, and macaques. 
So for sure, this, this idea of a commitment to lifetime of care and the challenges that that means for, for social housing, animals that require a social experience, is something that's really important for us to consider uh, as, we, as we equip animals for that. So, so it turns out that Susan Research Facilities have a lot in common, uh, and we really should be talking like this and really looking for ways that we can partner with each other uh, and, and, and come up with different ways that we can improve, uh, improve both animals in both situations. So I'm going to go through a couple, a few examples of, of different social housing or different social structures and social groups with, in, a, in a few different species and sort of try to give a parallel to, to an experience in research to, and an experience in zoos and sort of um, show how we, we have to go back and forth between one another and we can really use experiences in, in each, on each side uh, to help us move forward on the other side. So white, white crowned manga bees are also called sooty, man, sooty manga bees, if you've seen them called that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They live in these large multi-male, multi-female groups in the wild. Uh, and one of the interesting things about them is that they have uh, full-time resident males within their group, but they also have transient males. That these, so these are adult males that come in and out of the social group, and so they, they, they'll enter into the group and then leave. Uh, so, so the sort of intruders for some other species are perfectly normal as part of a manga bee social structure. So what that means for us housing them is that uh, all male groups are probably pretty, pretty likely to be successful because we know they're capable of having these all these male male adult interactions even with unfamiliar animals. So it's probably something that we can do pretty easily, and it also helps that that when they are aggressive towards each other, it's typically not that severe. Uh, and so submissive, and submissive behavior is signaled by avoidance, which is a really important concept when we're talking about social housing. Uh, understanding how animals uh, demonstrate their submission is really important to, to be able to uh, know how they're going to interact with each other and what we need to do for them to, be, so that, to allow them to make their social groups um, on their own. So, uh, so these low intensity ag uh, aggressive behaviors or, or social behaviors uh, like facial threats, that sort of thing are the predominant means by which they, they make their hierarchy. So we can take advantage of that and know that when we put them together, it's likely to be pretty successful with pretty low risk of injury. Uh, and it turns out that we can do that in a zoo. So several zoos now have uh, all male groups of pseudomanga bees living together pretty successfully. And so the same thing for olive baboons. Um, so these are our, our baboons at the, at the Seneca Park Zoo. Uh, they're actually research baboons. They came from Tulane Primate Center. Uh, as they were sort of phasing out their baboon colony, we uh, were building an Africa exhibit. So we um, have got a few of them. Uh, and one of the other cool things we can do in zoos is uh, all, so all the olive baboons are named after olives. Uh, so this is Sabina and Kalamata. Uh, so, so they're very cute. Again, we know in baboons, uh, they live in these lar very large troops, uh, up to 150 plus animals, very, lots of adult males, lots of adult females, and their offspring, uh, different offspring. They have a fairly stable linear hierarchy over time. Um, females also form friendships with males, and that's an important part of managing them socially. That gives us an opportunity uh, in, in research facilities where we might have smaller where we might be using pairs instead of uh, a troop situation like we have. Uh, uh, another important difference, though, from the, from the Sudi Manga bees is that these guys are really mean to each other, and that's perfectly normal. Uh, and so we have fi fights almost daily in, in the wild. We have that, too. Uh, and one of the challenges, for sure, for people, uh, especially our newer people, when they come is that uh, when, if we try to intervene too much when they're fighting, we're going to make it worse. Uh, and so we have to accept this is, uh, this is what, who baboons are, uh, and we love them for it. Uh, and so when, when they're fighting, we accept that, that part of, some, part of some, some part of their normal behavior is aggression. Uh, and that's, that we just have to manage that and accept that um, they will interact aggressively. Uh, 
Um, and so, so one of the things that's really uh, important is finding different ways for us to facilitate uh, social interactions or social groupings in animals like that, uh, where there is significant amounts of aggression uh, over time, and, and in a way that we believe what we're doing is improving welfare, right? Because that's what we're, we're really trying to do. Uh, and so if, if we're not trying to social house for social housing's sake, right? Uh, and so we do want to reduce aggression to the to the point where it's at some manageable level where animals aren't getting injured, significantly injured uh, all the time. And so uh, one of the things that we've been able to do uh, is recognize that, that aggression increases when these animals are, uh, the, the term the keepers use is, is in swell, uh, when, when their, their, um, their sex skin swells up, uh, that's what they say. Uh, so by suppressing their estrus cycles using contraceptives, we can reduce the aggression that, it, that comes associated with that. Uh, and so that might be challenging for research facilities where uh, we're really changing their hormone profiles, we're really changing their, their physiology to accomplish this. Um, but uh, for studies that aren't looking at that, maybe they're looking at, that, at behavioral outcomes, uh, maybe that's okay uh, if, if, if you can. And then for sure, this idea of surplus males is a challenge for us in zoos. Uh, that might be a, a correlative challenge in, in research facilities. So I had a few researchers at the university who, uh, who only wanted to use male macaques for lots of different reasons. And so for sure, those animals, um, that there's a, high, a heightened level of aggression in, in those males versus uh, animal uh, researchers that were using different, different sexes. So. All right, so, so going to rhesus macaques now, so a, a very common research species. So what do you guys know about their natural history? I'm giving it away. Yeah, so they live in, in very large groups with adult, many adult males, many adult females, and offspring. Uh, so again, a species that uh, should be able to tolerate the present, or at least tolerate the presence of other uh, adult males within the group. And so uh, just as a, as a, as a story, um, when I first got to the university, we, one of the, my first experiences within the first couple of weeks of, of working there was a meeting with our primate researchers. We had just had a USDA inspection. And uh, at that time, there were fewer than 10% or so of our monkeys were socially housed. And so she showed, sort of gave us a, a bit of an ultimatum. Um, this has to change by the next time I'm here. So we had this meeting with, the, with our monkey researchers, and they, uh, and they said, well, don't they know, these, these silly USDA re, uh, inspectors don't know anything about monkeys, don't they know we have these adult male rhesus macaques that'll kill each other if we put them together? Um, and that was, that was and isn't it obvious, don't they know that? So here I am, this 23-year-old um, veterinarian um, who's going to prove himself. And so I'm going to go uh, do all this research and, and show why, we're, why we can't socially house, right? And so it was pretty quickly evident to me that, of course, we can socially house. And what are these people talking about? Uh, and so, so of course, rhesus macaques can live in social groups uh, because they do in the wild. Uh, and so, again, very similar to some of the other species that we, the other primate species that we've talked about, uh, they live in these large multi-male, multi-female groups. Uh, the females stay, the males leave, um, and their dominant status changes over time, though. That's a little bit different from some of the other species that we were talking about. Uh, and something important, again, to remember when we're housing them in, in zoos or in research facilities, uh, that their dominance might change, so the monkey on bottom might become the monkey on top over time. Uh, and that's something that's important for us to consider. And when they do this, when they establish their dominance, over one another. Uh, they do it through aggression and non-aggressive behavior. So, um, so non-contact behaviors like threatening, like threatening facial expressions, grimacing, um, are really important uh, behaviors for them to cement that, that, um, that dominance relationship. And that's why one of the things that we do when we pair house monkeys is put them next to each other where they can see each other and through a divider, right? Uh, and that's a really, and that we know significantly, well, well often significantly reduces the level of, of aggression that we see when we open the, when we open the bars, right? Uh, and so, uh, but if they were only in those, if they only use those aggressive behaviors, then it would have a different connotation for when we were, when they were living together long term um, in, in that small space. But because we know they can cement that, that relationship over time without using physical aggression, it's, it's okay to, for us to pair house them in those smaller cages. 
And so that's what we did at the, at, at the U of R and what many of you have done at, throughout your facilities, um, really look, looking at benefits and risks of social housing. And for the, for the most part, the benefits far outweigh the risks. And we can, um, this picture is not showing up great, but we can pair house these adult male, these really big adult male rhesus macaques that wear collars, that are heavily instrumented, that are water restricted or scheduled, that are food scheduled and restricted, that go and do research in the lab for several hours a day because we know about their natural history and their social structure. And we know that these pairs uh, are compatible over time, for the most part. Um, and then, so then one of the other challenges that we faced at the university was small, small numbers of animals. Uh, and so we have uh, had about a dozen researchers uh, using rhesus and cinemologous macaques. And so in a few of the labs that we uh, we were, we were doing this with, we ran into this issue of, well, I have odd numbers of animals or odd numbers of species of animals. Uh, and so I have a rhesus macaque and a cinemologous macaque and they can't go together. Uh, and so one of the things that, again, I said as this 23 year old, well, that doesn't make any sense. They're monkeys. Um, and so I, I'm not showing you the natural history of cinemologous macaques, but it is a little different, but it's very similar and similar enough uh, that maybe it would be okay for them to be pair housed if the only alternative was for them to be singly housed. Um, so when so we asked around, and, of, and although uh, well, several primatologists said that's a really bad idea, they'll never get along. Uh, and so um, I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so. <laughs> So, I, so we opened the door uh, and it, it went really well. And as best as we could tell, there was no difference between uh, the way these animals formed a pair, uh, the way these animals formed a dominance relationship, and the way the other, the, the single sex uh, or the single species pairs uh, formed, a, formed a dominance relationship and maintained themselves over time. Uh, and so, so we did this in, in adult males, juvenile males, uh, females. The females were actually more difficult. Um, and I think, and I think cinemodelous macaque females are a little bit more difficult, but uh, I think everyone has their own biases, right? Um, is anybody else doing this? No? I'll think about it. Um, so we, there's a, I think, so Angelica is still at the university as a, as a behavior, uh, our behaviorist at the university. I think she's put out a couple of more papers after this initial one that describes some of the first ones that we did. Um, and so, so that has a little bit more um, science. This was more of a, a case report kind of thing, a case series. So having been so successful with monkeys, so by the time we were finished, we were up around 80, 85% of macaques at the university. So from less than 10 to, to above 80. And those, those last few really were uh, researchers that had odd numbers of animals. And so we, um, and we weren't um, making people go between, that, you know, two PhDs don't play in the same sandbox, right? Uh, sometimes, so, uh, so this, that was sort of our max. So, uh, so we were so successful with macaques, and we have we do a lot of orthopedics research there too, so we, and cardiovascular research. So we had a lot of rabbits uh, in single cages, and so if monkeys can live in in social groups and social pairs, then obviously rabbits can too, right? Um, pretty easily, because this is what we all picture when we picture rabbits, right? Uh, lots of happy rabbits in a field. So these guys for sure are social, and it'll be really easy, and let's just put them together. Um, and that's obviously not true, right? Uh, it's much more, much, much, much more complicated than that. It turns out rabbits are a lot harder than monkeys, right? Um, so, so what do we know about the natural history of rabbits if we really delve into it? Anybody? No? So, so rabbit, European rabbits that are the descendants of our, our research rabbits are descended from European rabbits uh, are actually really interesting among leopard species. Uh, they're the only ones that form stable social groups. Um, so Euro the European ra rabbit is the only rabbit or hare that forms social groups. So that should be a, a red flag for us, right? That something might not be right. Um, so looking at the, the social history of rabbits, uh, they can live in these large social groups with a dominant buck, many females, uh, and subordinate males, so adult males. So they can have males, uh, adult males around and tolerate their presence. There's a strict linear hierarchy in each sex, so, that, so that's a little bit different from monkeys. Um, males submit by retreating. 
that's a really important part, a really important difference in rabbits compared to monkeys or, or most primates. Uh, they submit by retreating or fleeing, uh, depending on the term, how you define your terms. Uh, so they need, to, they need to be able to get away to, to demonstrate submission. So if you think about the cages that we house them in in, in research facilities, that's probably not uh, not possible. And so the, this, this sustained aggression that we see in rabbits that we pair house in, in cages in, in labs uh, might be because of the way we house them uh, and the way they need to demonstrate submission is not possible in the cages that we, that, that we typically use. Whereas for macaques, our standard cages may be okay because of the way they demonstrate submission doesn't require the other monkey to leave. We also know, uh, looking more about rabbits, if, if you watch groups of rabbits, uh, they, don't, they actually typically don't form social groups unless they have to. Um, so in the absence of, and, and they choose not to form um, the warrens if they don't have to. And so uh, in the absence of a multi-entrance warren, uh, does won't stay in the same place. So there has to be different entrances for them to use, or they won't uh, um, nest in the same place. And if there are single, single dens that they can use or single burrows that they can use, does will preferentially use those versus using the multi-entrance warrens, so for the most part. So they will, so it, it might actually be that these animals are in this group because there's only one place for all of them to live in this environment. Um, whereas if they had their choice, if there were multiple places to live, maybe they wouldn't be together. So that's a really important difference. But we also know that, because uh, we started socially housing them anyway, because we had this sort of idea of rabbits are social, um, and we have to social house, socially house social species, we started doing it anyway. And we do know that even adult males, unrelated adult males, will engage in affiliative behaviors. Uh, they will choose to lie in close proximity, they'll share food, they'll allo groom one another. Um, and so, so there is some benefit to social housing them um, uh, males that are separated by a divider will choose to lay next to each other for the, for the majority of the time versus apart. Uh, so there must be some benefit to social grouping or social housing, uh, even if they're even considering uh, what their natural history is. Uh, so ch figuring out how we can provide them with that benefit uh, without the negative part and still allowing them to, in to demonstrate those species typical behaviors is, is the key to, to socially housing them. So when we socially house them in these larger pens, it tends to be more successful than, than socially housing them in cages. And there's also our group and others have done um, some other studies about um, social experience in rabbits. And rabbits that are pair housed or group housed in these larger pens tend to fight less when they're, when they're paired in those cages versus animals that go straight into the cage. So they've already maybe submitted that or, or cemented that that dominant structure, and then when they go in the, into the cages, even though they can't get away as much as they should, um, the, uh, the dominant buck still knows that, that that's, he's doing that, and we, we know each other. Uh, and so when we did it, we would pair house animals in these larger pens that were for dogs, that were built for dogs, that we, we didn't use many dogs. And then we would transfer them to these cages when they were going to go on study. Uh, and so we would pick, and so this is really time consuming, we would pick the two animals that um, spent the most time together. And so we would put like six or eight in a large pen. Uh, and then so these two animals that are hanging out together, those are the two that are buddies. They can go into the cage together uh, and they'll, they'll share food next to each other. Uh, so it's a strategy for, for making that more successful. Uh, and, and so again, thinking about different strategies that we can use, uh, recognizing natural behaviors and uh, in many species, including rabbits, uh, the males are really important as um, uh, aggression reducers. Uh, and so in rabbits, uh, the scent of, of the male uh, uh, the male marks the females, and that scent, we believe, reduces aggression among the females. So you can increase social housing of, of does or increase affiliative behaviors of does by dabbing uh, urine, the urine of a male on all the does. Uh, and so this is Joy Minch's work, uh, and, and uh, she's done some really interesting stuff with rabbits. So again, so something that doesn't change their physiology, but recognizes their natural behavior and their natural, their, their natural social structure. Uh, and so if you have bucks around, uh, you using the same one to, to 
to um, inoculate all the, the females gives you an opportunity to social house animals that you may not have had. But for sure, rabbits are complicated. All right, so switching back to the zoo. So I mentioned elephants, so African elephants are re really, really cool, right? Uh, what do we know about their social history or, or social structure? Yeah, so matriarchs, it's a, it's a matriarchal society. Anything else, any other big keys? Family groups. Yeah, so family groups with, a, with usually a matriarch grandmother, great-grandmother, and then multi-generational. So the, the females tend to never leave their natal group, which is a really important welfare thing for, for zoos. So just in terms of their, their nature, uh, elephants are, are extremely gregarious. So elephants have the biggest social network besides human of any, of humans of any mammals ever studied uh, so far. So they, they recognize hundreds of individuals and they remember them over, over time. <clears throat> so that's an extremely important, important thing to consider when we're talking about socially housing them and, and managing them. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Strong social bonds are formed between females, like we said, uh, mostly or usually related to all related to one another. Uh, and we and males often live alone, and we traditionally thought of males, uh, adult male elephants, as, as living mostly or almost uniformly solitary lives. But we now know that males, male elephants, do spend significant portions of time uh, interacting with other males, and they and outside of breeding season, so outside of must. They will form these social groups with one another, these bachelor herds, uh, that they'll spend 30 to 40 to 50% in, in some groups uh, of their time outside of must uh, in these social groups. And the, the really cool part is that those, those relationships are maintained over time. So uh, even, so they'll break apart when they go into must, but then elephants will return to the same, they'll hook up with the same partner or the same group uh, uh, in, in the wild. So they remember those animals, so they form, so males form these strong social bonds too. So that's really important. Uh, and again, elephants are, are sort of our, charismatic species for sure that uh, people care a lot about in zoos. And we know that spending time housed separately for them increases their stereopathies uh, and, um, and some other um, poor indicator, wealth, welfare indicators. So uh, social housing for them is extremely important and something that we, we really focus on. So these are our, our, our girls at, at, uh, at Seneca Park Zoo. Um, so we have Genesee and Lilac. Uh, if you've been to Rochester, Genesee is the, the Genesee River goes through, Ro flows through Rochester. And Lilac, we're famous for Lilac, the Lilac Festival. Um, we have really lots of Lilacs. So that's where they, those names come from. They're about 40 years old. Uh, all four were captured from the wild. They're about 40 years old. Uh, Genesee and Lilac have been at, at Seneca Park Zoo since the early 80s, so they're pretty well bonded to each other. Uh, and uh, about probably 2014, 2013, um, our accreditor, accrediting organization changed the standards for elephants, and so we're required to house three, any uh, institution that has elephants is required to have at least three, recognizing that uh, we never want them to be alone. So if one, if you have two and one dies, then they're alone. Uh, and it's it's quite difficult to move one, uh, so if we can do that ahead of time, um, then that's better. So uh, in 2015, we brought Moki and Shana to the zoo, uh, recognizing that we had these two older, these two older elephants. And so, so these are, so Moki and Shana had been together for about 30 years in multiple different institutions, but still they were moving together. So they were pretty well bonded, or are pretty well bonded. Uh, and so this is a really unnatural grouping, for sure, um, these adult, unrelated animals uh, that we're gonna force to live together now. But we know how gregarious they are, and so uh, sort of playing into that and giving them the opportunities to move in and out from each other uh, when they wanted to, uh, it makes it successful, and so so now we have all four together, 100% of the time, um, even overnight, and so that that was a big challenge, and so uh, or a big um, hurdle to overcome. With uh, we we have to separate them at night because we don't know what's going on, uh, and and we live in Rochester, so uh, the, they do spend a significant portion of time indoors from um, you know December to. Um, you know July, uh, <laughs> sarcastic, um, but almost. Um, 
So it's really important that they have the opportunity to have as much space as we can. So being able to, to socially house them at all times is, is really important. And we talk about in, in research facilities this idea of a social experience. Uh, and, and nothing or something is better than nothing, for sure. Um, but if there's not a real reason to, to, to leave all the doors open, to not to leave all the doors open, then we should do it. Uh, and, and for sure, I encountered that when I was at the university with and monkeys are not elephants. Um, but we'll, we'll separate them at night, uh, and that'll make it safer. And it's like, no, that makes it much more dangerous the next morning. Uh, and so, so sort of overcoming that hurdle is, is, is uniform for all species. And, and we also, because we also know that, adult, that these males have these strong bonds, we are, we're becoming much more sensitive to that for zoos too. Uh, and I'm just going to show this for, uh, for a minute. Let me see. I can figure it out. Um, so this is from the this is a video from the Birmingham Zoo. Um, there's only two zoos. I believe right now that have uh, uh, herds of adult males. Um, elephants uh, and and it's one of those things that again is so ingrained we cannot house adult male elephants together um, and and it takes somebody to really challenge that paradigm uh, to get there and and we know that they that they will interact with each other uh, and for sure so the alternative for these for all four of the animals that are in this herd would be singly housed to be singly housed uh, for the for their lives Look at the Look at this! And elephants, these males, they'll typically try to get up as high as they can, either to seem bigger or to give themselves an advantage, uh, leverage if they're fighting. So you'll see the little ones do it a lot, trying to get up to his eye level. So for Bawagi to step up on that is very so uh, it, it, it's pretty amazing to see uh, elephants like this. They're, they're playing, right? They're engaging in play behavior, which we know uh, is one of the most significant indicators of positive welfare that there is. Uh, and so the, the idea that we would never do this uh, is pretty exciting, that, that that's how far we've come with changing the paradigm. And so it's complicated for sure, and you saw that, that little bit of displacement at the beginning, um, but we accept that's a normal social behavior, this, that displacement. Um, um, but to give these animals the opportunity to, to engage in, in normal play behavior uh, is really important for their welfare, really critical for their welfare. And so these animals are, it's, it, it, I'm only showing you a couple of minutes, uh, for sure it's really complicated to manage them because uh, they do go into musk, uh, they do need to be separated like they would be in the wild, uh, and so giving them the opportunity to choose when they want to interact, when they want to engage in these behaviors it is really critical. The board, you'll stop. They'll move this around a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Showing off his strength. The same, yeah. You better walk away from me. So he's trying to do everything he can to get that other male to, to move away. Some males won't worry about it. They'll just go in there and start trying to beat him up. But he's a little bit more passive now. All right. All right, so how about snow leopards? What do, we, what do you guys know about the natural history of snow leopards? Solitary, right? So, so I had to give an example of a, of a big cat, right? That, that, so these guys are purely solitary in nature, um, except during periods of breeding and then a, a mother with her cubs. Uh, and so, so again, that's, as part of our mission, we have to conserve species, so we have to pair them uh, at some point. Uh, and so uh, this is Tamila above and Kaba below. Um, so uh, they, Tamila came to us last year, uh, to our zoo last year, uh, based on a breeding recommendation. Uh, and I um, will show you what happened with them. I'm Dr. Lewis, I'm the Director of Animal Health and Conservation here at Seneca Park Zoo. You may have heard we recently brought in a new snow leopard, Tamila, to be the mate for our male, Kaba. 
And so during protected contact introductions, uh, Tamila swatted at Kaba through the fence line uh, and cut his eye. The keepers immediately notified me and we began treatment. He came right up to the fence line, let us get a really close look at his eye, and then treat it with eye drops. We ended up having to do a physical exam under anesthesia, and we were able to confirm that the scratch actually caused the eye to ulcerate. So we were more aggressive with our treatment, but unfortunately, it still wasn't successful, and his, the globe of his eye ended up rupturing. So we had to take it out in a procedure called a nucleation that we were able to do here at the Zoos Animal Hospital. Kaba has made a full recovery. He's moving around his exhibit. He's jumping up on his furniture, uh, and, and we can't detect any visual deficits from before the surgery. The keepers were observing the animals during the introduction period, and it didn't appear to be an aggressive interaction, uh, more of cats playing with each other uh, along the fence line. Cats are solitary in the wild. You really wouldn't would only find them together for mating or for uh, or a mother with cubs. We've been really lucky here that our snow leopards have often gotten along, so we've been able to keep them together year round. But oftentimes in conservation care and in the natural range, they're solitary animals. In their new habitat, uh, Tamila and Kaba will be introduced again uh, around a mating time uh, so that we can mate based on a recommendation by the Species Survival Plan. So again, talking about sort of this idea of, of public scrutiny, we, we really, so we just built a new snow leopard habitat uh, right before or right after that animal came. So we heavily promoted her arrival um, to, to gear around this, this new exhibit that we were opening. So of course, now, so, so we're introducing the animals and the plan was to put them together in this new habitat together. So when we opened it, it would be, you know, this, this great thing, everyone was happy. Um, of course, it didn't go like that, uh, and so then when we were going to uh, open this exhibit, we knew that there would be a lot of questions. Um, for one, this animal's missing an eye, uh, and number two, they're, they're not together, and so where is she, where is he? She can only have one on exhibit at a time while they're not together. And so really being, being proactive and trying to promote what we're doing, and so if, if you think about when you socially house animals, recognizing that you, we all have stakeholders, right? Uh, so you, you know, and that was one of the things when, when I was opening the door uh, at the university was something I always thought about is, I, I'm gonna have to go tell this researcher that this monkey, one monkey did whatever to the other one, right? Uh, or one rabbit did whatever to the other one and they can't use it now. Uh, so for sure we all have these stakeholders, um, but again, being so, having to be so public about it is, is maybe something that's different for zoos. Um, and, and so like I said in the video, we had been really, uh, we, we, say, we all say snow leopards are solitary, um, but our experience at, at our zoo is that the snow leopards had typically lived in pairs, uh, so our, our, our zoo going public had always experienced um, for the last 10 or 15 years snow leopards living in a, in a pair. And it was a really, it is a really wide exhibit with lots of different options. So uh, even if they weren't next to each other, they were still, you could see them both. Uh, and so uh, us have only having one even on exhibit, even though we, only, even though we had both animals, uh, was a significant difference from what people were typically used to seeing. Uh, and so that was an important thing to, to really recognize that um, these animals can be, maybe can be social, um, but for the most part, they're solitary, and, and so we have to recognize that. So our new strategy was to wait until breeding season and, and do a more natural pairing, so uh, when she would be more receptive, they would be more receptive, although it really wasn't aggressive. It really was like they were playing, like he, she, she was a, a kitten still, essentially, uh, and they were playing, uh, and you know, you know how that goes. Um, and so because of that, uh, we are really lucky, uh, and, and this is sort of the, the bonus of being a zoo veterinarian, uh, we had snow leopard cubs born uh, on Monday. And so, so sticking with it and not saying, well, she, she cut his eye, uh, we're stopping, never again. Uh, we had to do it again. Uh, and so we did, and this is what we have to show for it. So it's really uh, exciting. 
And the other thing that uh, after, so we put them together when she was receptive to breeding, uh, and then we were sort of said, let's wait and see what happens. Uh, and so if they, if they start fighting or if they seem unhappy together, then we'll separate them after they breed. That's not what happened. They, they maintained close proximity to each other. They would sleep on the same bench together. Uh, and so they, they were bonded uh, after that. And so even though in the wild they might be singly housed, um, the zoo is not the wild. Uh, and these animals were happy together. Uh, and so, so we kept them together. Um, when she had her cubs, they, they were separated. But All right now. So the last few minutes, I'm just going to talk about um, using personality and temperament assessments. So some things that um, that we talk about uh, in, in that, that are becoming more that have been used in, in research facilities for a long time are becoming more prevalent in zoos too, and and hopefully we can apply those for for more in, in both situations. And um, uh, this is um, work from Dr. Capitiano at um, UC Davis um, at the Primate Center there. Is anyone familiar with his work? Um, uh, we invited him uh, to participate in the ACLAM forum last year that was mostly focused on welfare. Uh, and when I talked to him to invite him uh, and told him sort of the premise of why we were having him, he said, well, um, I don't do welfare. Um, my work's not about welfare. And, uh, and he was really, I could tell he was really uncomfortable with, with characterizing it that way. Uh, and, I, and I understand it, but I understand why. Uh, but if you, if, you can apply it to improve welfare too, um, and, and that's a really important concept for us to think about. So he's been using personality. Um, he, he wouldn't use the word personality. He would use the word temperament. His personality is a little bit anthropomorphic, but I'm used to say personality. Um, to un try to understand affiliative behaviors between rhesus macaques among rhesus macaques. And so he has, he, ha, he has lots of different traits, uh, and uh, he determined that equability, uh, which is um, like calmness, um, uh, activity patterns, excuse me, uh, we might call it, or I would call it introversion in people, sort of, um, and adaptability how directly are directly responsible or directly account for some of the, the variation that can't be accounted for by sex, rank, uh, those type of typical factors that you might think of, of determining affiliative behaviors or social relationships in rhesus macaques. Uh, and so that's really useful for us, and not only affiliative behaviors, but also uh, for, for those of you who work with, with monkeys that do these behavioral, behavioral studies uh, in, in training methodologies. So they respond to training methods differently. Uh, and so if we could use some of these temperament assessments to understand these two monkeys might pair well together um, or, and, and or uh, these two monkeys will participate in this, will, will accept being chaired and participating in this behavioral research study for the next 15 years of their lives. That would be much better than me saying, well, it's got a body condition score of three and it's got all of its hair, bring it on, right? Uh, so, so if we can use those methods to uh, understand one, social housing, and then two, uh, research involvement, it, it would be um, very useful. So it turns out zookeepers are able to reliably rate animal personality traits as well. Uh, and, and more and more studies are coming out demonstrating that these animal personality traits, what we think of, anim of being animal personality, uh, correlates with uh, individual breeding success, uh, pair, pair compatibility, the ability to live within different social groups, uh, how, they how well they train in the case of an animal like a sea lion where we have active, active participation. Uh, and and I, I talked about species survival plans in that, in that video. Um, and so most of our, the breeding recommendations that we do in zoos are based on these species survival plans. And they're looking at genetic diversity and maintaining uh, genetically healthy populations. Uh, and so it's great if those animals breed. Uh, but oftentimes, behavior incompatibility is a significant issue and in, in animals don't breed like we want them to. Uh, and so if we could predict behavior incompatibility, uh, it might help us a lot. Lot, uh, is in, especially in, in for species like a rhino, uh, where again it's very difficult to move a rhino. Uh, and so if we if we move a rhino across country to to have this great breeding because we want these awesome genetics, and then they don't like each other, uh, that's really costly, really time consuming, and really bad for that animal who's got to experience then another move. 
So if we can predict that, that's really useful. Uh, and so uh, in zebra finches, uh, there's been personality assessments. And so in, in so zebra finch pairs that have similar personalities uh, produce healthier chicks, so they grow faster, those sort of parameters, uh, than zebra finch pairs that have different personalities. Uh, and that's in contrast to rhinos, where uh, they tend to be more successful breeders uh, if they have opposite personalities. And if you so well, that's different. If, but if you think about their, their natural histories, uh, zebra finches, the males and females, both participate in, in parenting. parenting. Um, so in, in contrast to rhinos, where they don't, so, uh, so obviously they use different parameters to, to decide who the best mate is, um, but certainly people that, you know, we say opposites attract, um, but people that have similar parenting styles, right, are more likely to have successful children than people that don't, right? Uh, and so sort of a similar situation where maybe if we can uh, take advantage of that, recognize natural history, but still take advantage of, of using personality assessments, we can, um, we can predict uh, breeding success better. Uh, Terry Maple's group developed this gorilla behavior index back in the 90s, um, but they didn't really have a lot of animals to test it on, and so there's been follow-up work since then um, looking at uh, gorilla uh, behavior, and so uh, again, uh, sort of this problem of surplus males is really is a significant problem in, in our gorilla population in zoos. So we have to have bachelor, we have to form bachelor herds due to different space constraints. Uh, and so, uh, again, understanding which animals might be better in those, in those situations would be really helpful. And, uh, and so recent work has demonstrated that males that score higher on, on a trait called understanding are more likely to be housed in social groups and more likely to be successful in, in troops with other, with other males. Um, and then even though this, we're talking about social housing with other species, with, with other animal species, uh, I, I think it's really important for us to talk about uh, the, the idea of a positive relationship with people as being a really important uh, social dimension for the animals in our care. Uh, and, and I do think uh, we've, we've for sure embraced this in zoos and, and depending on, on where you are in your research facility, where I think we could do better better with this uh, and recognizing how important this is. So a lot of work done in farm animals uh, suggests that, they, that those animals have different, uh, the animals have different welfare outcomes based on, um, based on what they call stockmanship, so based on the relationship with their caretaker, caregiver, uh, even in the same uh, management situations, even in the same housing style. So uh, a pig in a gestation crate is not just a pig in a gestation crate. There's a lot, there's more to it than that. Uh, and so, so really promoting the idea that that the human caregiver has a really uh, strong impact on that animal's social experience, uh, whether it's in a research facility or in a zoo, I think is really important, a really uh, a big way that we could make a big difference. So just to summarize, um, uh, there's a, a really a common approach to social housing in zoos and research facilities, uh, and it all depends on understanding the natural history uh, and, and providing the opportunity for the animals to engage in species-specific behavior, so providing them with the ability to, uh, to demonstrate submission dominance as they would in nature uh, is really important. Um, and for just to, as sort of an aside, but not really, um, how many of you guys are familiar with the five freedoms? Probably everybody, right? How many are familiar with the five opportunities? So, so a few people. You better raise your hand, Jessica. Uh, um, yeah, right, oh, oh, you did? Oh, good, <laughs> good, good. All right, well then I won't, I won't belabor it, but uh, again, looking at more positive indicators of welfare, and when we're talking about social housing, for sure um, there's opportunities there for us to, to, to give, give them the opportunity to thrive through social housing. And again, remember the goal, and so I sort of touched on this about the idea of uh, we're not social housing, that for social housing's sake, we're really trying to improve welfare. Uh, so this is Lou, he's our 26-year-old hyena. Uh, he's the oldest hyena in, in North America, probably the world. Um, and when his hyenas have really complex social structures where the, the females are the dominant, uh, and so when his uh, female 
partner died about 10 years ago, Lou was uh, a different animal, um, happier, I would say, uh, being anthropomorphic. Uh, and so as at his advanced stage 10 years ago, we decided that it would be better for us to manage him singly housed versus trying to integrate him into another social group where he might not uh, thrive as much. So who knew that he was going to live so much longer? Um, but still, uh, we, we continue to believe that his welfare is better served being singly housed than, than socially housed. And so um, while I'm, I'm for sure a cheerleader for social housing, um, there are some situations that we have to remember where singly housing is better for, the, for that particular animal or that particular situation. Now you saw it, you've seen it three times now, but I, this is, I love this quote and I always end whenever, whenever I give a welfare talk about this, because uh, about anything, because um, I think this quote really summarizes what we're trying to do with welfare. Um, we're trying to do the best we can with the limited knowledge that we have, and uh, we all have to be open to when we know more, doing more and doing better with that knowledge. Uh, and so, so hopefully with, with continued communication, we can all learn from each other and still um, continue to raise the bar in what we're doing. So, so thank you very much.